has spent billions of dollars and thousands of lives to, quote, yeah. bring democracy to Iraq. But he is more than happy to deny democracy to citizens in Washington, D.C., the city he lives in. Washington, D.C.'s 572,000 residents pay taxes, but their single delegate in the House of Representatives cannot vote. The United States Congress has the power to overturn laws passed by city officials. The United States of America is the only country to deny full voting rights to its citizens living in the capital city. 1791, land given by Virginia and Maryland is named District of Columbia. 1800, District of Columbia becomes the seat of government for the United States of America. 1871, Congress establishes territorial government in D.C. In 1874, Congress ends territorial government and provides a board of commissioners appointed by the President. The Founding Fathers left it up to future D.C. generations to protest their rights. Taxation without representation has become the rally cry for D.C. residents and local politicians. And so the reason we still have it in the District of Columbia is because the way the Constitution was drafted, uh, the District of Columbia uh, is seen as a creature of Congress uh, to be uh, administered and overseen by Congress. Taxation without representation to me is uh, not being able to have the government held accountable for uh, its actions when the citizens aren't able to feed back to the government. I feel like if we don't have any say, then we're not really a part of the U.S. Okay. It's almost like we're a colony. And if we, if we don't have this say, then why are we paying these taxes? Mm -hmm. From the beginning of this nation, the people of Washington, D.C. have answered the call when the United States asked them to serve to fight for democratic freedoms here and around the world. Some returned, and some made the supreme sacrifice. The United States Congress sent them, and yet they have never had a vote in that Congress. The men and women of the District of Columbia are the only people living in the capital of a democracy today who cannot vote for members of their national legislature. With what greater glory could we honor their patriotism than to grant to them and all who come after the right of every other citizen of this nation, the right to voting representation in Congress? Bring democracy to the people of the District of Columbia. It's time. At the 2004 Democratic National Convention, Citizens and supporters of Washington, D.C. convened on the Boston Harbor, where 228 years prior, people fought to establish American freedom. What we are doing today, uh, my friends, this that we are doing today is no stunt. Our country can forgive us if they may, if we dump a little tea into the harbor today. It would take an amendment to the Constitution in 1961 for D.C. residents to vote for president and vice president. In 1978, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act amendment giving D.C. voting representation in Congress. The amendment died after failing to be ratified by 38 states. With the establishment of Home Rule in 1974, D.C. residents finally gained the right to elect a mayor and city council. Many thought and hoped that D.C. was on its way to becoming self-governed. That idea would be a distant memory when a financial control board was put into place by Congress in 1995. 
The board seized control of the public school system in 1996, and in 1998, the board took operational control of the city from then Mayor Marion Barry. In 1999, it shut down the city's only public hospital, D.C. General, and then the board disbanded in 2001. The nation's capital is one of the most crime-ridden cities in the United States, yet Congress has enacted legislation that would make it legal to carry firearms. Clearly here were legislators who had no regard for the city's will. You know, we passed the gun law 30 years ago, and it's never changed. All of a sudden now they decide they want to change it for us. He believes in, uh, you know, promoting uh, constitutional rights, and uh, he believes that people ought to be able to defend themselves. Uh. Even tonight, if we would approach Capitol Hill, how our car will be briefly paused and looked into, and yet you want to give people more access to more guns. The kids who are being shot by accident, uh, who are involved in crimes, they're not going to be uh, saved or be able to protect themselves because they have a handgun. In 2004, ignoring pleas from city officials, Representative Rodney Frelinghuysen, chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee on D.C., refused to remove a rider that blocks the use of local tax dollars to lobby for congressional voting representation. The ban also prevents the city from funding a shadow congressional delegate, two senators, and representative. Congress voted to force school vouchers on D.C. Senator Feinstein of California endorsed Congress's imposition of school vouchers while saying she would never agree to vouchers in her home state. Can you believe that the D.C. City Council unanimously passed a bill called contraceptive equity and it was overturned by men, yes, they were all men, except from out of town. This is outrageous, this is immoral, this is unfair. There have been several bills introduced in Congress concerning voting rights and representation for D.C. There's two bills. There's one that uh, is where we would get one vote um, in the House, but then Utah, a very conservative place, would get another vote. His idea of what we need is a lot less than everybody else's rights in our country, which is we get one vote in the House, no senators, no governor, no legislature, no autonomy, like every other state. Yeah, the Congressman introduced the uh, District of Columbia Voting Rights Restoration Act uh, to restore the same voting rights that residents of the District of Columbia had prior uh, to their being carved out of uh, Maryland. You can't just put us in another state and force another state to accept us. So I don't really think that's a viable um, option. There's absolutely no reason why we couldn't merge with any other state. And for my money, I'd like to go with Alaska because we get the oil royalties. <laughs> in 1993, when we did get a vote on statehood, when we had momentum, when we had a lot of people who were very involved, and the people on the Hill were somewhat supportive. Immediately, this group of people that didn't want us to get statehood came up with this idea that we would join Maryland. I mean, D.C. being a laboratory for neoliberal ideas. What I mean by that is you can test school vouchers here. You can test uh, privatization of hospitals. You can test building baseball stadiums. And so D.C. in many ways is a laboratory. And just like lab rats, um, the people in the city are left um, to die after all the tests have been done. In a 2001 article, President Bush stated that he is against D.C. having two senators. When he took office, he had the taxation without representation license plates removed from the presidential cars. Congressman Rohrbacher does not support statehood just for D.C. Um, he feels that it's unfair to give two U.S. Senators to just one medium-sized city. Um, he also doesn't believe that uh, the District of Columbia would be viable to be a state government. I disagree with that uh, assumption. First of all, we continue to act like a state. Uh, the federal government treats us like a state for all kinds of political and legal purposes. No, that's actually a flawed argument. Uh, I'm surprised that someone would make it uh, because South Dakota has less people uh, than the District of Columbia. They have less residents and they obviously have two senators uh, and one House member and a governor. It's really the people that matter, it's not the size of the jurisdiction. You know, it's a majority black city, that's something that people do look at. 
uh, and, and that can be holding us back, and that's very disappointing. I like to think that the Congress are more sensible than that and bigger than that. You know, there are four jurisdictions in the United States where the population is ethnically majority non-white. Puerto Rico, Guam, the Virgin Islands, American Samoa. All of these places where the population isn't majority white lack equal representation in Congress. I think the things that play the most factor are the party, I think it's very obvious that there would be two Democrats from the District of Columbia. The main resistance that we've come up against, unfortunately, is D.C. residents. And we hope that at some point D.C. residents will realize that it's in their benefit um, to try to claim the right to be like everybody else instead of uh, being so distinctive um, when that distinctiveness involves a lack of rights. But. We, the people in the District of Columbia, are asking for what we are entitled to. Three D.C. veterans of the war in Iraq are asking congressional leaders for D.C. voting rights. The men were part of the first wave of soldiers to enter Iraq in March 2003. That this is my country, I live here, and I want to spread the same things that I do have to others to make sure they have those same benefits. The problem is a lot of people in the U.S. do take what we have for granted. Those who have the vote in Congress do not know what it feels like not to have it. So a lot of them, when the topic comes up, say, hey, D.C. doesn't need it for me. They take it for granted. One of Delegate Norton's goals and priorities for the 109th Congress is to secure the return of her vote in the Committee of the Whole on the House floor that she won by rule in the 103rd Congress. I don't know that a mere vote on the House floor would be sufficient to give us the type of political enfranchisement we need. In reality, House floor votes tend to be more about party discipline than the individual interests of constituents. What's really needed are two voting senators. On January 27, 2005, Senator Lieberman and Delegate Norton held a press conference announcing they had reintroduced the No Taxation Without Representation Act in the House and Senate. I think that it is viable that uh, we can get a seat in the House, and I think that's an acceptable way station. Now let me emphasize that that's a way station to full representation as, way, as full representation is a way station to statehood. Now if anybody else had less, then we might be asking for too much. The people uh, here in D.C. in 1982 voted uh, to apply to the Congress for statehood and we need to continue with that process until we get, our, uh, get what we deserve. There must be statehood. Statehood is irrevocable. No territory has ever been granted statehood and then lost it. You don't take away statehood. When D.C. residents are ready to, to claim the rights that were taken away from them, we think those rights will be given back. No matter what one's political belief is, the fact remains that over a half million voices are not being heard. Why should the citizens who pay almost the highest income tax per capita be mute in the very house this country is built on? With the city being over 80% Democratic and majority of its citizens African American, it begs to wonder if America is really ready for a predominantly non-white state. America is the catalyst for democracy around the world. We welcome the opportunity to place our governing system on other countries. If D.C. sat on foreign soil and its citizens were not being heard, America would intervene. Statehood is a clear and attainable goal. It can be done without a constitutional amendment requiring only two legislative acts on the part of Congress and the President's signature. Every year thousands of Americans descend on D.C.'s National Mall to celebrate the independence of this country. What independence do the citizens of the District of Columbia have to celebrate?